Introduction to just the foregrounds in 21 centimeter, including power spectrum and global 21 centimeter measurements. The next two are basically the kind of diffuse models that are there, which we can use for modeling the data, for doing simulations. But mind it, these are diffuse model emissions. And finally, we have some ionospheric effects, which are technically part of foregrounds, but I'll see if I can cover it in this uh, lecture. Otherwise, we, we can do it in the next. So basically anything that comes before the instrument, then these are the four things. So we'll start with what are foregrounds and this part is really important, which is foregrounds in context with global 21 centimeter experiments. So for example, pressure will be talking about the power spectrum measurements and you will probably appreciate more how foregrounds manifest very differently in the two kinds of experiments and even the techniques and the requirements of your instrument become very different. Uh, of course, foregrounds are dominated by different kinds of radiative processes uh, and at the frequencies we are talking about, I'll basically touch upon them. What kind of models do we have right now? Unfair. And finally, how do we model them in, in real experience? So just one summary and probably for the lectures, we'll probably be able to simulate this with the visual nice lectures. The whole idea that I want to drive in here is basically the redshifting process. So you are looking at different redshifts, different frequencies. Because our idea is what kind of foregrounds will exist at these frequencies, right? So today you learned about dark ages, where the couplings were changing from uh, uh, original coupling to radiative coupling, and therefore you have this very nice feature. And in the rest of the classes, probably you'll also do more of the rest of it. But the take-home message is the redshift. So we are talking about redshifts of around say 200 all the way to redshifts of 6. So these are the cosmological redshifts where we expect a differential brightness difference between the spin temperature and the background radiation. And therefore we expect the signal to be non-zero. The question is, these redshifts will translate at different frequencies. So we are talking about frequencies from 10 megahertz to frequencies of 200 megahertz. So when we design an experiment, of course, we have to look at what operational frequency ranges are there. 
and therefore any experiment that wants to do this has to operate somewhere there. Ideally, it should have the full coverage, which is impossible. So we'll, we'll touch upon that later. So the question is, what kind of foreground exists at these two points? So we're talking about tens of megahertz to of megahertz. This is a snapshot of the data, right? Um, so this was taken by not uh, our actual experiment controls, but one of the prototype antennas. Just to show you, when you actually observe the data, what do you see? So y-axis is the brightness, similar to the brightness that you were seeing here for the signal. A very weird unit called uh, dB, uh, which can be converted to kelvins. And the x-axis is the frequency from, say, 40 megahertz to 250 megahertz. So you get the signal to lie up till here. But of course, what you see is nothing like signal. Um, and two things that straight away come up, the two distinct features. One are these vertical spikes, which I'll not cover in this talk. And these are the radio frequency interference, right? So at these frequency ranges, for example, these lines are known to be FM lines because FM does transmit in this range around 100 megahertz or so. You have some satellite lines also. And at very low frequencies, you have a lot of terrestrial interference coming from power lines, switching signals, solar panels and so on and so forth. These are very hard to distinguish. But that is the first distinct feature that you see. And you can, in principle, develop flagging. People who have been doing here observations with different telescopes might be well versed with how to flag these lines. But sitting on that, you see a baseline which is not flat, right? That also has a region. And that is basically the topic of today's lecture. So this basically comes from the intervening medium between our signal and our telescope. So the extra galactic regions and the galactic regions collectively form this baseline. So we'll try to understand how this baseline is created and especially what is this spectral characteristic, right? And can we actually model this? So you might have looked before uh, one of these maps. This is not a real measurement, but a kind of an extrapolation uh, at 80 megahertz. But it's our galaxy uh, in radio. And you can see how spatially varying the whole emission mechanism is. We have regions which are relatively cold. We are still talking thousands of Kelvin. And uh, so mentioned here, the differential brightness temperature is around tens of millikelvin. So on the same scale, you can you can uh, overlay this. And this is thousands of Kelvin in the coldest region. And by the time you reach the center of the galaxy which is really the brightest region in the radio star, you really go to tens of thousands of Kelvin. So one thing when you design these instruments, you also have to look at what fields you want to really look at. These regions are conducive towards foreground subtraction. and In global experiments, we don't really have a lot of that options because our field of view is traditionally very large compared to the parametric measurements that you will learn about later. But still, there is some bit of a degree of freedom that we should be. On the third, um, I have basically taken an average. Average across all the pixels, you get a single brightness number. We are plotting that as a function of frequency. And then you can overlay the signals too. So as Karan will probably tell you later, signal is not deterministic at all. It has a huge wiggle room, simply because the astrophysics of those high redshifts are very, very unconstrained. So you can have a plethora of different models, but even if you took an envelope of those, you still have a huge dynamic range to deal. And another thing is, since people who are very new here, when we talk about global signals, we are looking at the sky average part, not the fluctuation as Karan said. So we basically take your huge swath of the sky and average over the spin temperature fluctuations to get a mean number. And that's what we use to model these things. And that feeds into what kind of systems we design that I'll come to later. Ah, so these different colors are basically different model predictions. So let me go back here. So you learned in the first lecture in the and you saw there was very little headroom because your kinetic temperature is known how it changes with redshift, your CMB is known. From here, the first galaxy is formed, all the way till end of reionization. You also have this additional term coming from the galaxy, the Lyman alpha photon. 
and that really changes the whole ball game. So now you have more sources of radiation in both Lyman alpha in X-rays, and you learn about this later. So you can basically vary the whole parameter space, which is huge because none of it is constrained, to produce different signatures. So different colors here are basically different model predictions based on the properties of the first galaxies. And yeah, please, uh, I really want this to be interactive, so please stop me wherever and uh, ask questions. If we get derailed, doesn't matter, we can continue in the next class. Uh, so I have this foreground. Because you can see the variations is huge, so I just, just for a representation, I've taken this. But yeah, ideally, it will also have a huge variation depending on where you are looking. Um, which are we talking here? Yeah, no This dip is certain, almost certain, from our atomic physics system. These features are completely unknown. Yeah. Uh, I mean, observationally, yeah, you would want to constrain that. But theoretically, uh, depending on when the first sources begin, this tip is basically uh, constrained by X-ray. Like when do X-rays really hit, uh, start hitting the IGM? And that really is, can happen anywhere. Yeah. So, so the positions of this and the position of this uh, has a huge uh, wiggle room. What we know is everything ends by this ratio, around 5 to 6. But uh, this part, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There is an upper limit in the standard model. There is no lower limit. So the maximum amplitude of this basically comes what Swaskanan was saying. You have gas which is cooling and uh, your spin temperature is coupled to the gas. So there is a maximum contrast that you can allow based on what is the adiabatic cooling limit. So that this is not the maximum. So that comes around 200 million. So under standard regimes, you can't go, in, in mode of amplitude, you can't go more than that. But lower limit, it could be zero. You have. And that's really one of the motivations why you want to do this experiment, right? To be able to constrain these properties. Now, foreground itself is not a monolith. Uh, for people who do galaxies, they will hate being in this audience <laughs> because we're just talking them as nuisance parameters. They have a very rich astrophysics and uh, some of us probably here have done those studies, um, right? So if you look at this is one of the most popular actual radio measurements. This is called Haslam map at 408 megahertz. We'll probably do a bit about it in the tutorial. Uh, but this basically shows you the brightness and the morphology of uh, galaxy and extragalactic objects. You can see how rich the whole thing is. So when we talk about foregrounds, we tend to, you know, say, yeah, 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 galactic, extra galactic things. But within that, there are very interesting science cases. And that's also one of the data we're missing. You could do a lot of morphology studies, uh, shockwave studies. You can look at the spectra of different sources and try to do some astrophysics even with that. But yes, when it comes to global signal, everything's a nuisance. Ideally, we would not want any of this. Um, but having said that, um, there are ways to subtract it. And, um, I will mostly focus on the galactic foregrounds. And there is a reason to it. Um, again, in the power spectrum, we'll probably look at more uh, point sources, which are the extra galactic regions. Uh, the reason I'm not covering is because it's not important for the global signal. Um, as I said, we are averaging over a large patch of the sky. We have a huge field of view, because of which a point source, especially, gets very diluted. Right. So the contribution, you can also compute it yourself. Even the brightest of the uh, point sources. So on this map, Cygnus probably is the brightest source. We're talking about thousands of Janskis here, at uh, actually more kilo Janskis probably, uh, at Cygnus at these frequencies. They will get extremely diluted uh, just because for the global experiments, the, the beams are very big. Well, that's not the liberty within the parameters, and you'll appreciate this very So our foregrounds are mostly the extended structures, something that fills up the beam, uh, because that doesn't get diluted, and therefore, you really measure thousands of Kelvin temperature. Note that these are for the fluctuation numbers, so they not, may not be a very accurate representations of the program, but the general idea is the same. 
So there are directly programs, and then there is the cosmic dawn universe. So these are the two aspects that, that uh, I'll discuss. Any questions till now? Okay. So when we say foregrounds, what are the different things we are talking? And um, this is a nice map from the very first reference I mentioned a minute ago. Foregrounds are everywhere. It's not really specific to our experiment, the 21 centimeter cosmology, but even if you want to do CMB measurements at, at hundreds of gigahertz, you will still have to deal with some of them. But the underlying physics changes, right? So for our uh, frequency ranges, and you can see here is our POR uh, band, you are really dominated by two different processes. The first is synchrotron radiation, and the next is free free or the Bremsstollen emission. Um, again, I'll mostly focus on synchrotron because it is the most dominant component all across the band, right? So even if you hide in the coldest regions of the sky, you'll probably see it. Right. So just a very quick premiere on synchrotron. And I really can't get into the details of this simply because that requires, I think, two lectures. Uh, but uh, one nice reference that I can point you to all is Rebekian Light. If you've already not studied it. It's called Radiative Processes in Astrophysics by Rebecca and Lightman. There is an entire that's dedicated to synchrotron radiation. And I'll only touch upon aspects that are useful in going forward here, right? So what you really have are magnetic fields and electron interplay. So this is a very nice schematic where you have these magnetic fields and these are all in our galaxy. You have electrons gravitating around it. Now, what we know already from, say, Larmer's uh, formula, any kind of an accelerated charge will radiate, which is basically proportional to the acceleration. So, in the process of gyration, uh, there is a very beamed emission, right? Because we are talking about relativistic electrons here, so very large values of gamma. So, we have this beamed emission coming towards the observer. Now, just like you may have studied cyclotron, there is a characteristic frequency um, where the emission is peaked. So similarly in synchrotron, but because it is relativistic, it's not really the same. But you do have something called a characteristic or a critical frequency, omega c. And I'll write the expression, but I only want you to take away the dependence on the uh, term or what the gamma square. How is it dependent upon that? Rest of it is basically determined by the magnetic field and the pitch angle. So in some way, if you look at, and this is from a single electron. So if you have an electron which is gyrating in the magnetic field, uh, it's a spectrum can look like this. So this is your omega or the frequency, the power key of omega. So omega c essentially is, and as you can see, this is a directly proportional to the square of the Lorentz factor or the gamma. So this is one takeaway, which is in synchrotron, you don't have a line emission, you actually have a broadband emission, because that becomes important for our foregrounds. And the second is, uh, it is very critically dependent on how energetic the electrons are. So then the question is, how do these electrons become so energetic, right? What drives them to gammas of hundreds? I mean, we are, we are talking about very close to speed of light. Uh, people who have done it, the answers. The like electrons in our galaxies, what makes them so accelerated? Yeah, good. I can assure you, whatever you say is a factor, it might be dominant or the subdominant. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, in our galaxy. Yeah, so we do expect radio, radio emissions from even uh, active galactic nuclei. Right. Uh, but here we are talking about electrons in our own galaxy. Uh, there must be a mechanism to accelerate them so much. Uh, so that's all true for extragalactic. So yeah, when you look at a specific, say, Cygnus age, uh, you will actually see all those effects uh, because there is a accretion happening, there are jets associated, and that will produce these kinds of things. But here, uh, sorry? solar wind. Uh, well, so, the most dominant form is uh, not really solar wind, uh, it's shocks. So, uh, 
again this might be another lecture but do look up something called fermi acceleration so basically when you have shocks forming and shocks can form very easily in astrophysical scenarios uh, electrons can basically go uh, in and out of the shock and with every cycle it gets accelerated by a huge margin uh, so that is called fermi acceleration and in our galaxy this has been observed by many so shocks can form for example in supernova uh, so those kinds of uh, physical processes can really accelerate the electron to very high velocities and then it becomes uh, basically it, it gains the kinds of uh, lorentz factors that we are talking about so again without getting into the details of this we what we would want to do for our cosmological modeling is how the number density of these uh, or the distribution of the energies of these electrons are because right now what we have here is emission from a single electron but of course when we are looking at scales of kiloparsecs of our galaxy we want to look at an ensemble of average we basically what is the distribution we want to average over that so that and again this probably is specific to fermi acceleration it has a power law distribution so you have number density as a function of different gammas comes some spectral index this is for a range of gamma so for specific range of lorentz what you see is the energy of the electrons are distributed as a power law and this becomes again very important because you will very quickly realize that that literally defines we have a measurement like this why is this a power law right as you can already see so this is tied with what is the energy distribution uh, of these electrons in our galaxy right. so there is a bit of uh, uh, algebraic surface which i'll probably ignore but essentially what we want to do is compute what is the total power as a function of frequency what you have to do then is power from single electron and you then basically average it over this n gamma term and um, this and you have to make um well power from a single electron is a very uh, non trivial function of mega wave mega for these two do refer to the rubicular lightman but essentially power from a single electron is a strong function of the critical frequency the critical frequency itself is a strong function of lorentz factor so you can use both of these facts which is when you look want to look at the power spectrum which is what we are doing uh, of the ensemble of electrons you take emission from one and basically look at what the energy distribution of electrons is and this p of omega you can replace by that and then basically this is going from gamma 1 and gamma 2 you can just do one change of variable this consider omega by omega c will be that and you can do all of this and finally write what you get this is the p total now the uh, initial limits were some lorentz factor uh, range but again if you look at a very large values of these gammas the x can really go from 0 to 0. so most of this integral actually becomes a single number again this is a very qualitative expression um that your final uh, spectrum of the signal will be dependent on the power law by this so in some way what you can say is my t synchrotron is a function of minus x 
where the spectral index is related to the energy distribution of these electrons. So two things, one, it is broadband. So when we look at a plot like this, it won't be restricted to a specific energy range. Looking at a few megahertz all the way till gigahertz. Really at around 100 gigahertz, is, it actually becomes subdominant to something else, which is the dust. So maybe Tuhin and others can comment more on this part of the uh, spectrum. But for really a very large range, this plays the dominant role. So, and the second takeaway message is the spectral nature. And that is very important when we look at either the kind of models that we have and also the way we want to tackle these in our data. Which is to say that essentially it's a power law. Of course, there are a lot of nuances associated with that statement. But overall, we don't expect a physical mechanism that can produce this to have very local frequency features. Right? So for example, a sinusoid in a foreground is probably not there. And the simple reason is that these are very broadband mechanisms with a huge range of energy distributions of electrons. So that basically, yeah. Oh, this is the, the spectral index of the electron energy distribution. So because, yeah, when you have Fermi accelerations, you have a whole range. You will find more of them at low energies and less and less at high energy. So overall, what is that spectral index? So that relates to the spectral index that we typically measure in the radio experiments like this. So what we measure is S because we want to see the slope of the frequency, which is related to the spectral index of the energy distribution, which is astrophysically important. Any other questions till now? Otherwise, we'll again change gear. Okay, so that is uh, Synchrotron. If you are interested in other, Rebecca Lightman is your book, and you can always uh, chat with me offline if you are interested. So we'll we'll get back to our observations. This was the theory of foregrounds in some way. So just this 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 bit I always love to explain whenever we talk about foregrounds. This is uh, 1933, and we have Karl Jansky. Uh, who was an engineer by training, trying to do some transatlantic communication. And uh, he was seeing a signal which was always there or always repeating in some way. And back then we did not know that we had radio sources in the sky. Most of the radio was supposed to be for the ones we were designing for communication between different antennas. So this was the first paper. Um, and it, it, I love how it says, I have taken more data which indicated definitely that the stuff, whatever it is, comes from something not only extraterrestrial, but from outside the solar system. So that was really the first clue that, okay, we have something that's happening like this. Now, you can place yourself in the shoes of Jansky and say that, okay, I'm there. I've been observing something which is, I don't understand what that is. What would make you say that whatever that stuff, it's extraterrestrial. It's not from the Earth. Like it's not that a nearby microwave is open. It's not localized. Oh, it's you are persistently getting it. That yeah. No, that that's one good clue. Yes, it's not sporadic. Coming from all the sides, but there are astrophysical things that don't come from all the sides. If you're looking at a galaxy, like Milky Way. You will have a stronger emission when it is in your field of view, but once it sets, so a lot of astrophysical things can also be not transient, but they have a diurnal variation. Yeah. Okay. It was at night. So you have terrestrial emission at night also. I'll show you the data. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So periodicity of when you are receiving this. That's a good uh, deal. But then you can have periodicities, for example, well, sun is a wrong example, uh, but yeah, you can have periodicities with things on earth. But that's a good lead. 
Annual motivation. How does that help? Okay, so I think overall we are arriving in the right direction, which is it has to do with the periodicity or the time scale of motivation. And the key here is local sidereal time versus earth time or the local time. So the difference is when you look in the frame of reference of the celestial sphere, uh, the cycle is not 24 hours, 23 hours roughly. So any kind of a celestial source will not repeat in 24. So I think that's where we are getting at. And that is a very nice clue to disentangle between something that's coming from the sky versus something that's coming from Earth. So for example, all these sources that I mentioned here, like in this nice uh, plot, so when you go through interferometers, look at the rising time of these sources, they will always be offset by four minutes every day. Because again, there is a lag. And that's a very good clue that something is of extraterrestrial origins. And that was answer. But he kind of stopped there. Like he, he, he did publish, of course, saying that we have reasons to believe that there are things outside that emit in radio. But really the first maps of our foregrounds were by Groth Ripper. And his ashes are still in a lot of observatories around the world. He literally built this telescope in his backyard just to try to study what kind of emissions uh, are there. And uh, he did three different frequencies. And of course, he got the detection only at the lowest of the frequencies. And that is simply explained because synchrotron has this nature. So you have more and more brightness at low frequencies. So here he says, um, he had whatever units were there, he saw the center of the galaxy and then Cygnus and Cassiopeia. These are basically, Cygnus is one of the exoplanetic sources, the supernova remnants. So basically, these are the brightest uh, objects in the northern hemisphere. Uh, he, he could see all of these, these maps. So this is the map from the 30s and 40s. And you'd be surprised to know that uh, at these frequencies, these are still one of the existing maps that we have. We have done very little to extend this, especially at very low frequencies. Of course, at higher frequencies, we have other things. But when you look at 10 megahertz and less around that region where you expect dark ages, <laughs> there, there are maps which are still in the catalog from Groth River. Okay, but we have improved and the current understanding of foregrounds since the 1930s has substantially increased. So now we have maps. So we have dedicated telescopes which are trying to study the foregrounds, their spatial behavior, their spectral behavior. And you have this partial map right from 10 megahertz all the way till gigahertz and above. Now we have even hundreds of gigahertz uh, thanks to Planck uh, WMAP, CMB experiments essentially. But you can see the coverage is not uniform. And that's simply because you have a telescope on a very specific location on Earth. You can only observe so much of the sky. And sometimes these are not continuous observations. You only see patches. So because of this, you have all kinds of different funny features here. We do have some off time maps. In our frequency map, one of the, as I said, uh, key maps is 408, Haslam map, which is a full sky map. And for a lot of uh, research that happens, people tend to extrapolate this to the lower frequency. And I'll argue why that's not correct. Um, there is a substantial variation in the spectral features. So if you compute spectral index from here and extrapolate, especially for the kind of science we are doing, uh, that might not be the most accurate. And we do have maps at low frequency. They may not be as accurate or may not be as complete. And that's one of the aspects of today's talk, that how do we fill in this information? So any questions? Okay. The rastering technique. So you want to survey the sky very fast. So when you do that scanning strategy of you know uh, a specific track on a, along array deck, when you project it on a more wide view like this, you do get. So this all depends on how you are scanning the sky. Now ideally, if you scan more and more, you will fill everything. But probably that was not done. I have to go back and check what that map is. But yeah, that's coming from your scanning strategy. 
Okay, so we will move from here. And this is an equation which you all should keep in mind uh, for all the lectures of what is it that we actually measure, right? And then the other questions arise about how to extract signal, how to model programs. But this equation is the final equation in, in radio interferometry. A very close competitor to Prashun's visibility equation, which will come, where the baseline term will also get added here. But for a global experiment, this is really the key. So let me So I'll go over the different terms here. Uh, what you really measure is the antenna temperature. Now, antenna temperature, so the way these telescopes work is you have a field of view, you are observing the sky in that field, and over time the sky is reflected. So in some way, you are mapping different regions of the sky which are separated in time. So that's where the first time dependence comes. But at the same time, you want to do this measurements at all frequencies. You really don't want to measure separate frequencies at separate times. And we have enough technology in our uh, global experiment designs to be observing simultaneously. And that's really the key. When you go to much higher frequencies, for example, experiments like Planck and WMAP that do uh, the CMB observations, you will see that the multi-frequency measurements is the big bottleneck there. So you can only measure some spot frequencies, say 100 megahertz, 150, 200 gigahertz or so on and so forth. But when you come to low frequency, just because of the way you compute the spectra, and this is just from FFT, uh, you really get simultaneous measurements. Uh, so you don't get like every 10 megahertz or 20 megahertz, but you get measurements literally a few kilohertz apart. And when you play with the data in the tutorial, you'll appreciate this more. So the first thing that it would depend is basically the foregrounds itself, right? So you have all of these things here. And these foregrounds, are a function of azimuth, duration, and frequency. All the possible degree of variations exist in the foregrounds. I'm conveniently skipping polarization because of the time, but there is a polarization parameter also. Foregrounds are polarized. Synchrotron radiation that I talked about has polarization. So depending on whether you are measuring which linear polarization, circular polarization, you'll probably get different values of this. So that's something to keep in mind. But for majority of the global 21 centimeter experiments, we only look at one polarization, the linearly uh, polarized comfort. Now this uh, foreground, which is intrinsic, and that's what we are going to talk about for most of us, most of the talk today, is then multiplied with the response of your field of view. So how is your field of view changing? So, so suppose I have the sky, and because of my field of view, I'm looking at this part of the sky. So you can imagine drawing a circle with some radius. Now, that region, of course, is a function of theta and phi. So regions are you looking at, but most importantly, it's also a function of mu. So your, in some way, your radius of the circle can change. At different frequencies. And we are looking at frequencies right from 40 megahertz that basically starts from cosmic dawn and going all the way till 200 megahertz, that is the end of reionization. From antenna engineering, uh, you expect your field of view to change enormously. Right? It also depends on what kind of antennas you have, but overall you can't make this constant. There will be a frequency dependence and I'll tell later why this is important. Okay. Why is there a frequency antenna? Yeah, so your field of view of antenna, this is the intrinsic property of the antenna itself, that your field of view is changing. And just to put it shortly, and we can go into the details when I talk about antennas, is most of the antenna dimensions are not electromagnetically in meters, but in wavelengths. So if you have a meter long antenna, what we'll really do is L by lambda. So in units of wavelength, the antenna dimensions keeps on changing over your entire thing. And here our wavelengths are 6 meters to roughly 3 meters. So because of that, in some way, you can imagine it's literally different antennas at different frequencies and therefore the field of view will be different. Okay. 
it's just the gain of the antenna or the beam of the antenna chromaticity in some way we say to only look at how it's changing with frequency but in, in some way this b term you can call it either primary beam or gain again they are interchangeable for this exercise they are in antenna engineering it's not the same but the point is because we are also normalizing this by something so it doesn't matter fine and then you basically multiply it over the solid angle can be just the uh, sign uh, so it's actually So, in, in, in observer coordinate system, your phi is azimuth angle. So, you are observing over the entire region 2 pi and the theta is the elevation angle. So, if you are on earth, you will only do 0 to pi by 2. Now, this is a very, very important um, equation and going ahead, we will be using it in our method. Yeah. So this is Yes. So, so yeah. So that that's why these are called drift scatter. So the sky is drifting. In principle, you can write this as theta phi because you know which theta phi you're looking. But yeah, the time dependence comes from the non-stationary Earth. Okay. So what you can do is you can take your TF, which is this, or well. Not exactly TF, it also has other systematics, but for time being, let's take them as intrinsic foregrounds. You can take whichever field pattern, your favorite ones here, and basically you can do mock observations or real observations of how your sky will be observed, which is the antenna temperature. So this is the basics. So the first plot that you saw is that. And this is a real data. So of course, we don't have to do this integral antenna does it for us. But that's the crux. But now the question is, how do we know? I mean, this itself, we have some control and there are papers exactly just on this, which is how do you measure your B? I mean, of course, your simulation gives it, give, gives it to some accuracy. And then your measurements probably also give, you, give it to you at some, at some accuracy. But is that accuracy trustable? Whenever, especially in 21 centimeter, when we talk about any quantity, we really have to talk about error parts. So there is a lot of thought going into this, I'll touch upon this later, but for today's lecture, which is the foregrounds, how do we know this, right? So you saw, this is all we have. Of course, I might have missed some or other maps, but it would change the overall uh, status very significantly. So we have something at 10 megahertz, something at 17, something at 38, 154, and of course, we all know that in order to measure this signal, we need much more. We can't be just looking at uh, some of these very specific frequencies. So, so we have a map at here, we have a map at here, we have 150, and then we have something which is completely out of the map. So really in this, we only have six or seven frequencies. So then the question is, what do we do? So can you think of a way in which we take this and then try to predict what this will be at other frequencies? Because we really need a very broadband, very finely resolved measurement of this kind. And mind it, many of these, them are partial. Any thoughts? I will not accept extrapolated Haslam map. Anything else is fine. Yes. <laughs> huh. that, that's fantastic. Yes. So, one thing is you can try some kind of uh, interpolation in some way, assuming some frequency dependence of these uh, terms. And that you have seen because this is all synchrotron dominated. We know kind of spectral behavior of this. Of course, we don't know this spectral index to you know fifth decimal place, but we know it's broadband, it's power law like. We know how what the coherence scale is in the frequency axis and how spatially it is changing. So this spectral index is not constant along the sky, it can change. 
but we have some clues so yes anshuman uh, one part is that we can try doing some kind of a svd and and basically try to interpolate between and that's really one of the things i'll be talking about in some minutes but anything else and this is also a research problem so don't worry if you have some thoughts you can write a paper on it uh, people don't still agree on what's the best strategy so but yeah i will start with that and that was in 2008 and that's also my second reference which is how do you interpolate and you have two issues one the noise is different on the different maps and the second all maps don't have the same coverage so how do you overcome these two limitations and try to make a map which is multi frequency not at only the spot frequencies but over the entire range of uh, dark ages cosmic dawn epoch of reanimation so that is called um, global sky map or gsm and this will be part of your tutorial exercise tomorrow so you will actually generate the maps like the ones that you saw before and we'll try to do some science with it but i'll give you an overall picture of how it works so how many of you are actually familiar with uh, principal component analysis or singular value decomposition okay so i'll start from the basics um so the recipe is uh, the following you only take the ones that are full sky map because what you have to do is you have to develop a basis function so the most uh, i would say obvious choice people have tried before is some kind of a polynomial because you can see the spectral features that are here are significantly smooth spectrally and this is in very contrast to the kind of signals you are looking for right so because of these turning points your signal spectral characteristics and your foreground spectral characteristics are very very different and in any kind of model when you want to generate a diffuse model of the foregrounds that's exactly what you want to use so what people started off was something like this so you want to generate your sky model at some frequency you have map some other frequency and what you do is you basically the spectral index at your reference frequency and propagate it right so this will basically tell you if it's something at 150 what will it be at 110 just because of the beta value but as i said spectral index is not constant and different ranges of these frequencies um, actually have very different properties even within synchrotron so again again it's not only lit it has different energy distributions it has different spatial variation so this method very quickly uh, was realized to be not so correct so in this paper uh, 2008 um people have tried to form the basis functions not from the polynomials but basis functions that are informed by your data set itself and that is basically called a uh, principal component analysis so the basic of principal component analysis is that you have a uh, multi frequency measurements or multi variable measurements so you have foreground changing with pixels you have foreground changing with frequency and what you want to do is form basis functions that best describe this variation right because what you do usually is you do these polynomials or spherical harmonics they don't really capture sometimes if you don't know the physics good enough they may not capture all the variation but with principal component analysis it is certain because it you are deriving your basis functions right from the data it's looking at the variations in the data and it basically produces your basis functions that maximize that range so mathematically the way you do that is you form a covariance matrix of your each pixel so you have say 11 frequency measurements so you form this pixel averaged 11 by 11 covariance matrix and uh, you can then try to diagonalize that so what you are looking at is the eigen vectors and the eigen values of your matrix and your basis functions are nothing but eigen vectors so these all eigen vectors 
are basically telling you along the frequencies, frequency axis, what are different degrees of variations of your foregrounds. And of course, your number of eigenvectors will be same as number of frequency points that you have used. And in this case, in GSM, for example, it's 11. So you have eigenvectors which are like this. So the, the, this is the principal component. It has been normalized to some way. This is the frequency. And this basically tells you the first three uh, principal components or the eigenvectors. Right? And you can already see how much of the variation they are capturing here. So the first principal component basically captures an overall fluctuation. Across. And then the second one I think is the blue one here, which kind of captures synchrotron, but again these are not really physically motivated, these are data driven. So it also can capture other additive processes. Then you have third one, which at least in the high part because it's rising up might be hinting at free free emission of REMS tolerance, things like those. You can try to connect them to physical processes, but overall just from a data science point of view, it basically tells you that okay if I have a map like this, and I look up along the frequency direction at any pixel, what kind of dominant variations do I see? So in some instead of for polynomial, you must use, if you are doing polynomial, there would be a constant function u0, then a linear function, then a parabolic function, those were your basis functions. Instead of that, you have these. And because of the very nature that they are driven by the data, they will capture all the possible data. So this was one of the first very popular and accurate model of the diffuse emission. Any questions till now? Yes. This was done on pixel average, but what you can do is once you have your principal components, you can form the best linear combination at any pixel. One of the missing pixels. No, so principal components will be the same. So what you can do is you can find the best linear combination from your maps. So essentially, when you go to this. Now, for your principal components, you actually may not even have used all the frequencies. You may have used 11 of such a subset. But once you have principal components, what you can do, you can, number one, you can make this into a functional form because these are things spectrally very smooth. So you can do some splines, which is what they did. And once you have this, you can evaluate it, your frequency of choice and find the best linear combination that can describe your foregrounds. And actually, there is a map of this. <coughs> So you can do this for all pixels and you can see what different principal components are captured. So once you have basis functions, you can be free to optimize it the way you want. All you have to do is find the best linear combination of them. Right. So for example, the first principal components, you can compute this for all pixels independently. And you can see that it's capturing the broader uh, emission. The second one, as we also speculated, is mostly capturing the disk, which is synchrotron dominated. Then you have other components as you go to lower and lower uh, eigenvalues. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Great question. So let me go slightly into the basics of how the optimization is done. Uh, so I'll start from uh, the, the way we have computed the eigenvectors, which is P. And this correlation matrix is basically computed by the uh, frequency by frequency correlations. So what you can do is you can have an independent noise estimate, right? So your map at each pixel i can be a subset of your eigenvalues and the, the linear coefficient that weights that principal component. In this term, the ni term is the noise in that map. So you can compute what is the fluctuation the RMS noise in each map separately. So now, what you want to find out is AI. So what best linear combination describes the data best at every pixel? So what you can do is, you can do an inverse noise variance with. So essentially, ZI, which is our map, 
then we have transpose times i first times c. So in some way, what you are saying is, when you want to find out the best fit coefficients, you downweight the maps that have more noise by doing this in, in uh, inverse. This is the map. And that's also a reason, uh, typically we do a PCA on a, a covariance matrix, which is just uh, this, y by t. Here, you have normalized it. So this is what we call a correlation matrix. And that is also in some way accounting for different sigmas. We are making in some way the noise the same. But overall, you would always want to do a noise inverse variance weighting when you want to fit for the linear coefficients. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, great question. It will matter. I think I don't have a plot, but um, it's precisely for this reason that when they computed the uh, basis functions, they only used the region that was overlapping in all the maps. So I think there were 11 of them which they used, uh, but the eigenvectors are derived from one specific region. Ideally, you would want to do this from the whole sky because you don't know eigenvectors from that region describe the spectral variation better at others. So then, there are lots of tests one has to do because of this limitation. So for example, in this uh, global sky model, you have 11 maps, you take out one, you compute everything from the rest, and then predict what the map will be for that frequency which you deliberately skipped, what's called, called as cross verification essentially. And look at the kind of RMS error that you get in order to predict and what you actually have measured there. So to that extent, this method has worked well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there is no, uh, better way than getting, like doing this on a full sky map instead of the pixels you have chosen. And the same holds for the frequency also. These are spot frequencies, so that is another limitation. You will gain enormously if you have more frequency. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, your principal components here. Huh. These ones. Yeah. Huh. Huh, huh, correct. So basically from the principal components, you can fit out the functional forms of this. So now you have your eigen vectors or the basis functions at your frequency of choice. So you can fit a low order polynomial, you can fit a spline. But yeah, the reason we are able to do it, or rather allowed to do it, is because they are spectrally not very complicated. So again, it ties to the physics of synchrotron. It helps us to do this. Yeah. Yes, great question. So I was coming to that. Uh, yeah, so there are basically uh, two things, or two advantages of this approach, of modeling the foregrounds. One, uh, once you have these, you can literally compute uh, your map at any frequency within this, and you will do that precisely in the tutorial. The second one ties up with how many principal components you use, and that is given us by the eigenvalue spectrum. So, you have eigenvectors and eigenvalues associated. That basically tells you how much each eigenvector is contributing to your total power. And of course, absolute value doesn't matter. You can normalize the first one to one and look at for each principal component, what is the associated eigenvalue? So what you see, and this is a log scale, the first few principal components really capture the maximum variations. So if you actually look at the principal components for each pixel, these first three capture majority of the sky variations. So the rest of it may not be as important. And for all you know, majority of might also be capturing your noise in systematics. So how do we truncate uh, how many modes we want is by looking at these eigenvalues. So, and it can also be region dependent. So when you look at the paper, 
it's a free parameter the the number of uh, eigen vectors is m star and m star can be determined by looking at the eigen uh, values what you can also do is for example you can reconstruct the map by using three pr uh, principal components do it by four see how much extra you're getting at each okay. if you already saturated this new point so that is another reason why uh, this uh, principal component analysis is popular not just in astronomy but otherwise it really reduces your number of dimensions right so polynomial if you are using 10th order we see here because it uses these, these custom basis functions you can capture everything in three orders so in image processing for example it it drastically reduces your storage space and other kind of requirement any other questions yes frequency frequency coherence now so there will be but that bias will only be for the diagonal terms because noise in the two different frequencies are not correlated so yeah diagonal term is essentially your variance and that yeah that will have the bias but uh, yeah independent measurements are uh, uh, statistically independent now noise bias the Ah, and that's why you see the first component is roughly the flat part. It's capturing all the variance. No, no, no. So actually, usually when we do this for that reason, uh, in this case, we haven't done that. So uh, the noise is very much there. Uh, and we have no, done no mean subtraction. So that's why the first principal component really captures at all frequency what is the variance across the band. That's part of the basis function. Any other questions? Uh, if not, I think we can stop here. Um, one hour, lot of foregrounds. And uh, we will basically continue this in tutorial tomorrow, where we'll actually generate these maps and try to do some kind of a foreground model. And then in our next lecture, we will look at another foreground model. Uh, which is more physically driven and then go to our basics of antenna receiver calibrations basically coming to this part after that okay thanks